And I think that's a, a great segue, uh, that question to our next presenter. As, the, as rapid intensification uh, becomes more likely, higher instances, instances of that in the Atlantic, the ability to communicate effectively with the public becomes um, really so important. And so our next presenter up, who worked alongside Giancarlo this summer, is Ariana Gaines. Ariana is coming to us from the University of Puerto Rico at Mayuez, um, and she also worked in M Cubed. Her uh, mentors were also James Doan, Alexandra Ramos Valle, and Andrea Schumacher. And Ariana's title of her presentation is How Would Social Impacts from Hurricane Ida in Louisiana Differ with a Westward Shifted Landfall? So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ariana Ginez Ocasio. I am a physics and meteorology undergrad student at the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez and for my NSF NESI project this summer alongside my mentors James Doan, Andrea Schumacher, and Alexander Ramos Valle, we developed the project titled How Would Social Impacts from Hurricane Ida in Louisiana Differ with a Westward Shifted Landfall? So some background on Hurricane Ida. It made landfall in Port Forcon, Louisiana, just by the southeast of the state, the 29th of August in 2021 as a very strong Category 4 hurricane in the Saffir Simpson scale. It is known that wind and storm surge pose the biggest threat from tropical cyclones, and we can see this in Ida as there were two direct fatalities during the hurricane due to the high winds, and then there were 26 fatalities after the hurricane from mostly wind-related impacts such as power outages and carbon monoxide poisoning from uh, power generators. This is why it is very crucial to effectively, effectively communicate forecasts and warnings to the public, specifically with vulnerable and underrepresented communities who may have a harder time accessing this information as different sociodemographics receive information through different sources, as well as they may not have um, the resources to prepare for a hurricane or even uh, recuperate after the hurricane. So the National Hurricane Center released their Hurricane Ida storm report in 2022, where they expressed there was a south and west bias in their track models before Ida made landfall. Then they modeled Ida's storm surge 15 nautical miles east of Ida's actual track, just to demonstrate how storm surge is very sensitive to track changes. But however, we imposed the question, what would the in-wind impacts look like if Ida actually made landfall more to the west? Additionally, the main purpose of this is to identify which socially vulnerable communities would receive exposure to hurricane winds in both the actual track and in the westward deviated track in hopes of delivering weather information effectively to in the case of a future tropical cyclone with similar characteristics to Ida. So for my methodology, I have two parts for this methodology. The first is the social science aspect. So first, the social data that I use is from the Social Vulnerability Index data from the Center for Disease Control, or CDC. And I chose five variables. The first three variables are people over the age of 65, racial and ethnic minorities, and households with no internet subscription. I chose these first three because these are people who either have a harder time accessing weather information or may have a harder time interpreting weather information. And then the next two groups I chose were people in mobile homes and people below the 150% poverty estimate. And this is because these are the people who are most likely to receive the worst damages from the winds. I plotted these in our studio just to see the distribution of these groups and later apply this to my wind data. And I did this at a census tract level. If you're not familiar with a census tract, it's a, basically a smaller subdivision of a county. So it's not more specific. More specific. Then for the atmospheric component of the project, we used the wind track data from NOAA's Historical Hurricanes database. And we applied this to the wind footprint model described by Donut Owl. And we did Ida's actual track, or our control track. And then we did the westward deviation with a five-year average position error at a 72-hour lead time. We chose a 72-hour lead time because we believe it was a decent time for people to prepare for a hurricane without it being too far in advance where forecasts still have a larger margin of error. Another thing is that this wind, this wind model, besides modeling wind two kilometers above the surface, it also has terrain and surface data. So it also models how the wind interacts with the land. Then finally, to determine the extent of wind impacts, we, we chose the maximum wind at each census track. So here we first have the first three SVI variable maps. 
So these are the sociodemographics who have a harder time accessing weather information. So we have the minority population of Louisiana, people who have no internet access, and people over the age of 65. After this, we have the other two, the other two groups, the sociodemographics who receive the, who could receive the worst impacts from hurricane winds, which are people in mobile homes and people below the 150 poverty estimate. Now here we have the wind tracks we did with the wind model. Works. Okay. So here on the left we have Ida's actual track, and on the right we have Ida's westward deviation. And in these uh, blue boxes right here. Um, I circled basically the area where it received over category two winds or more. And as you can see in the westward track, this area is a lot smaller just by firsthand seeing it than in the actual track. And this one possibility of this could be due, due to the land cover in the west side of Louisiana. Since I mentioned, this wind model also includes terrain and uh, surface roughness data. Additionally, something important to note as well, with the westward deviation, we only moved it in its x coordinates, meaning that they are both the same track. Okay, well, basically, they're both the same track, but the westward deviation is only moved in its x coordinates. Then, after that, we incorporated the wind data in the census tracts to see which census tracts receive uh, major uh, hurricane category winds. In the left is also the maximum winds with the actual track, and on the right, the maximum winds with the westward track. And the legend goes is in meters per second, and it goes accordingly from the purple, which is tropical storm winds, all the way up to the yellow. In the actual track, the yellow represents category five winds. We got two census tracks that received category five winds, and this is uh, not too surprising since this area right here is where Ida actually made landfall and they were only about one to two meters over category four, so it's nothing too significant, but it's still classified as a category five. And then on the right, it goes to the yellow, which is just um, category four winds. And already, as you can see that in the actual track, there is a larger area in the blues where there are, those are major hurricane winds, so category three or more, than in the westward track. After taking the maximum wind out of each census track, we plotted the amount of people who would receive category two winds or higher, and we chose category two or higher because with category one or less, it was such a great amount of people that it will wash out the results from the higher category winds. So with the actual track, as you can see, it's very evident that a much larger amount of people were exposed to category two winds or more. However, in both tracks, the people under the 150 poverty estimate and people in minority groups are the ones who have both the highest results. With a little under 50,000 people for the people in the 150 poverty line, and almost 60,000 people in the minority populations for the actual track. Additionally, in the actual track, category two winds seem to have the largest impact overall, while in the westward track, we see a larger impact with category three winds in the minority population. So one of the reasons why we see a larger amount of people being affected could be due to the extent of winds, but what about population density? So after assessing the extent of impacts, we determined the extent of the wind in square miles. So with the category four winds, they have an almost equal amount of area, which is very surprising considering that with the um, sociodemographic data, the actual track almost had four times more people who were impacted. Then for the category three and category two winds, the control track uh, skyrocketed its values. It has a way larger area of exposure in square, mi square miles and can also explain the results from the sociodemographic impacts from the actual track. However, in the westward track, it is considerably a small amount of area. So right here, yeah. Right here, as you can see, it's a very small amount of area. And in our sociodemographic plots, this was the wind velocity that affected the most amount uh, of minority populations. So this can mean that in this small census tract area, we see a larger population of underrepresented minority communities that can reside there. All right, and so since the wind model we use takes into account terrain and land cover data, 
Right here is a plot of the actual data that the wind uses for surface roughness. In the green, as you can see, I don't know if it's very visible, but in, there's like a mint green color. Those are croplands, and the red and the yellow are forests. Forests and croplands have a high friction coefficient. And in physics terms, a higher, higher friction means it could be a faster wind decay. So this can be one of the reasons why these sit, we see this wind decay in the westward track. And then from the VAR plots, we found that people under the 150 poverty estimate and minority communities are most prone to these wind impacts, followed by people over the age of 65, households with no internet, and then mobile homes. And then from these census tracts, to have a more general idea, we found what parishes or counties uh, these are located in for the actual tract. We have the Lafouche, Jefferson, Terrebonne, St. John the Baptist, St. Charles, Livingston, and Plaque Mines parishes. And then in the westward tract, we have the Vermilion, Cameron, and Iberia parishes. So for my findings, it is crucial to be able to communicate future warnings and forecasts with the population of southeastern Louisiana, where there can be communicated for the minority population more warnings in other languages. For example, Spanish, a big part of that minority population in Louisiana are Hispanic and Latinx people. And for the people under the 150 poverty line, resources should be provided prior and post a hurricane since they may be the ones who are the mostly physically affected from the winds. Additionally, these people may not have the resources to prepare, evacuate, and recover from these events. Therefore, emergency management, electrical companies, and other government services should be aware of these populations inside of these parishes mentioned in the southeast of Louisiana. And then for future work, it would be very interesting to apply a similar methodology to the one used to observe the social impacts, but with Ida's storm surge, with its actual track and by deviating it to the west. Additionally, it is of personal interest of mine to work with weather translations from English to Spanish to serve underrepresented communities in the US and Puerto Rico, knowing so many Hispanic and Latinx communities are prevalent in the studied areas of Louisiana, drives me further to work on this in the near future. I'd like to thank my mentors for their guidance and help throughout the entire project, and my NSF and SE coordinator, Jerry Sacconi, and grad assistant, Benjamin Feldman, for allowing me to participate in this amazing program. And last but not least, my cohort peers and my now new friends, for, <laughs> for making this summer an unforgettable experience and making me feel more at home. Thank you. That's wonderful research. That's so interesting. Thanks. We have some questions for Ariana. Questions? Yep. First, thank you, Ariana. Um, just to let you know, I actually responded to Hurricane Ida. In, uh, we ended up in Lafayette for the landfall. And the way you're talking about it, if it moves to the west, it was astounding how different. You know, we were in a place, and it rained. There was actually nothing. And then within about 40 miles, we were into the south end of home and some of the areas on there towards uh, Thibodeau and things of that area. And, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. But the question in terms of moving east to west, in terms of the the notification and then the, the people, obviously you go further west out of New Orleans, it becomes more rural um, until you get into the Lafayette area and the Baton Rouge area and things like that. Uh, but it's also not that inhabited because it's a lot of the swamp and things of that nature. Um, so when you looked at the numbers of folks and, and what would happen if it did go west versus the wind speed and how the, the impact of the thing versus the people per square mile, was there a significant difference in the kind of in their impact? Or is it more of just the economics of tearing up a bunch of grassland instead of factories? So in terms of population density, with the actual track, of course, in the actual track, it comes a lot closer to New Orleans and its vicinity. New Orleans is the capital, so it's very um, densely populated. In the west track, where it made landfall, I looked at population density maps. And where it made landfall, it, there was a spot that was, seemed pretty pop, um, densely populated, and it was near the coast. Um, but still, surprisingly, the results weren't as uh, shocking as I thought it would. I thought there would be more people. But of course, this doesn't mean that 
you know, that place is uninhabited. There's still a lot of people who live in the wetlands as well. There's also Native American communities who live uh, near the coast of Louisiana as well, and they were really affected in Ida. Um, so mostly uh, we want to can also work on the wind model as well. Our wind model, we did kind of a simplified version of it. So we can improve our the westward track we did with our wind model as well. We may see some differences in the extent of wind. So that can also impact these results as well. So. And then follow up with the information that Giancarlo gave, was there, did you guys notice in between this project any indications that might help us forecast to early notify folks, to give them that 72-hour update in terms of, yeah, we expect it to get worse, we expect it to get better. Um, yeah. Was there any indication, in particular with Ida, uh, what would have happened had that been one of your RIs or not? I'm, I'm not an expert in forecasting models, so I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. But um, at least with the 72-hour lead time, as I mentioned, I mean, different models have a smaller margin of error depending on their lead time. Some, some are good at um, forecasting 12 hours in advance, six hours in advance. Some of them are better at forecasting way more in the future, 72 hours, I think 90, forgot 98 hours, somewhere around there, 96 hours. Um, and rapid intensification is also sometimes spontaneous uh, as well. So I don't have a definitive answer there, but Communicating it to people, obviously we want it to be as more in advance as we possibly can. Um, but sometimes hurricanes can last minute change track or something can happen to the hurricane. So uh, yeah, so you also don't want to do it too far in advance where there's still a larger margin of error as well for uh, landfall. However, even though there was a south and west bias, um, the model still showed consistently it making landfall in southeast of Louisiana. So it was definitely making landfall in Louisiana at least. So. All right, we've got time for two more quick questions. Thanks, Ariana, for a great presentation. Um, this may not be directly related from your presentation, but I wonder, like within literature review, maybe just from personal experience, how much do you think public members, especially those in and around like Louisiana and coastal areas, know the term rapid intensification? Do you think that communicating this term like would help them in terms of them understanding, you know, the impacts or like the severity of the situation? Just or just from also looking through literature, if the public has any understanding of what that term may mean. I really haven't read on the public understanding what RI means. Um, mostly I've just been reading about how the public interprets uh, forecasts and uh, warnings, and as well on how some weather forecasting offices, they, you know, they should know their audience, they should know their local area, what, what, what communities they're serving. In Ida, New York City was really badly impacted um, because a lot of weather forecasting offices, uh, well, warnings were sent out in English and mostly the fatalities were people who did not speak English. So that's a big problem still. Um, Ida was very recent. So that's still a big problem that needs to be tackled uh, to the extent. Thank you. Hello. Um, um, I, I was wondering, since we're talking about resources and how we can um, give that to the public if you looked into um, prevention methods, um, for example, the levees that failed during uh, Katrina or things of that nature? Um, I didn't look at, at least for levees, I didn't look too much into it. At the first of the project, I was going to look more into flooding, but then it changed into wind. Um, but there were some, I know there were some levees that failed during, um, during Ida. Um, and that's why we want to do storm surge in the future. Storm surge, it would be really interesting to see these impacts since, again, a lot of people live in the coast, specifically of Louisiana, and also inland flooding as well. Uh, but for preparation, uh, I didn't look too much into it. So, yep. Wonderful work, Ariana. And you and Giancarlo working together. Um, can I ask you both real quickly, how was that, one of you or both of you, how was that collaboration for you? It was pretty chill. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, it was pretty chill. Uh, it was. <laughs> I'm going to put that on our brochure for Nessie. <laughs> it was pretty chill. No, but we worked a lot uh, with our mentors. We had our, uh, weekly meetings with our mentors, and it always went really well. We communicated really well, and we kind of shared ideas. 
Uh, and our project did slowly started drifting apart a little bit. He went more to our eye. I went more to Ida's wind. Yeah. But uh, it still complemented very well. And yeah, our mentors are amazing. So mm -hmm. it all went well. <laughs> Do you agree with that, Giancarlo? Yeah, I think my, my favorite part was uh, just, I mean, you could probably um, agree with this too, is we'd be working, and I'd be like, let's say, like on a meeting or something, and you'd be in a meeting with one of our mentors and everything, and you'd hear the, <sighs> and then the occasional like slam on the desk, and you'd always hear the laughing of the vet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that always happened, but, you know, it was definitely a great summer, and like I told you earlier, I think that if we had a little more time, we could have definitely converged back and make a really beautiful story, but I think we do have a very good, uh, just kind of a... Uh, I think a good project in our own ways, which I do appreciate. So I would love to even implement some of her own project, I think, into something in the future, because I think that's like the whole reason why we're doing all of this is kind of to bring it back to the public and like what everyone, you know, everyone's safety. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you both and your mentors.